Okay. Okay, doctor, I am now presently recording. And so okay. please, uh, you're, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've been spending a little bit too much time sitting in this chair the last couple of months. We've been doing a lot of the, you know, telemedicine like everybody has been. And it'd be nice when we can get back to seeing patients, at least in person. We're, we've been treating ever since the whole thing started. We're actually treating seven, around 70 patients a day right now. We've just been doing what everybody else has done to, to take the appropriate precautions. So what I'll be talking about here next you know, 30 minutes or so is a little bit of an update. And some of this is going to be information that especially the intro part that I showed a couple years ago, but there's also going to be some slides that are updating on clinical information that's come out since I gave the talk in 2018. There have been a couple of nice studies published, and I'll touch on those near, near the end and certainly leave some time for questions. So let me get this going. Um, that's just the outline, brief history, talk about what is in particular intensity modulated proton treatment, what are some of the newer trends in proton center design, which are making this therapy much more accessible, definitely. Update some long-term results and talk a little bit about uh, SBRT, using protons for treating prostate cancer and what my experience has been to date, because I was just starting that in 2018, you know, two years ago. You look at the history of radiation treatment, and I think most of you have heard of these two gentlemen. This is Dr. Renkin on the right uh, discovered x-rays in 1895 and Henri Baccarel the following year discovered natural radioactivity. So these are all things that happened very, very quickly within a year of each other, right around the end of the 19th century. And it, we didn't know at the time how it worked, but it turned out that the way radiation works and the way you kill things with it is create DNA damage on the molecular level. That's true of protons. It's true of x-rays. It doesn't matter. Both these types of radiation work by creating DNA injury. And the injury isn't always expressed immediately. So when you radiate a cell and you create this damage, that injury may not be expressed in some cases for months to years because the injury is only apparent to the cell when it attempts to replicate. Before it happens, it's perfectly happy and you know thinks that everything is great. But then when it attempts to replicate and grow and divide is when you get into issues with uh, problems with growth and the cell will then die. So this is it again on the molecular level. We're creating ionization. We're taking atoms and we're, we're, we're busting electrons off so they're becoming charged. That interacts with DNA. That causes a, a DNA strand break. So it's like taking a blueprint and screwing it up. And while cells can repair this damage to some degree, the ability for cells to repair that damage is quite variable. And fortunately for us in the world of radiation therapy, it turns out that malignant cells are somewhat less able to repair that damage versus their normal counterparts. And that's why you can kill a cancer and hopefully not kill the individual because of that differential cell kill. So I mentioned it was discovered pretty early and you know, 1895 and literally within a year of the discovery of radiation, they're the first reports in the scientific literature of people using it to try to treat cancer. And obviously they had no idea how to do this or what was even happening, but it was based upon a clinical observation that one of the, the first things people noticed when they handled radioactive substances or when uh, Dr. Rankin kept putting his hand in front of his uh, x-ray tube is they'd get skin redness, some skin reactions. So I thought, wow, something is affecting the skin. We know the skin grows rapidly. We know cancer grows rapidly. Well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Th this picture you see in the background, though, is a monument to what one of the things that happened. And this, this is a monument in Europe. I think it's in northern Germany to what are called the radiation martyrs. It has the names of several hundred physicians on this who died because of radiation induced illness. They didn't understand the dangers. And as a consequence, they were overexposed, you know, and they died of various malignancies or other issues due to radiation therapy. So much of what we've learned in radiation treatment, just like much of what we learn in life, unfortunately, is learned through the good old school of trial and error. And that underlies many of the things that we currently do in clinical radiation therapy. So basic tenets of radiation treatment, again, this applies to any radiation. And, you know, remember, Protons are a type of radiation treatment. They're not something I keep in a jar and I, you know, sprinkle around while I'm doing a dance or something. It's a type of radiation therapy. We 
people talk about radiation resistance. So some of these cells are resistant to radiation. There's no such thing. It's a question of how much dose you want to give. You can kill anything if you give a high enough dose. Any living cell you can destroy. Some are more difficult than others, but there is no cell that can take whatever you punch infinitely and keep on growing. As I mentioned a minute ago, in general, the malignant cells are less able to repair that damage, which is why we can kill them with radiation doses that are generally well tolerated. And lastly, and this is an important uh, concept as well from this radiation protectant standpoint, people have been arguing for decades, is there a threshold? Is there a dose below which there is no discernible damage, uh, deleterious effects like carcinogenesis in normal tissue? And you know, people have made their careers on this one way or the other, but the currently accepted opinion among radiation biologists and radiation protection individuals is there is no threshold. We have this principle called ALERA, which is an acronym that stands for as low as reasonably achievable, meaning that whenever we do radiation therapy, we should be giving as little radiation to healthy tissue as we possibly can. Because we don't know what that, we know there's toxicity. We don't think that there's a dose below which there isn't toxicity. And we do know that low dose radiation in some respect can be more harmful than high dose. Now, what I just talked about, Alera and sparing normal tissue, this underlies the development of virtually every piece of radiation therapy technology that exists and every different technology. You look at brachytherapy, you look at you know, modern x-ray therapy, you look at what I do. All these things were designed because they allow you to be more specific as to where you put the high dose, reduce the low dose somewhat, and thereby reduce the harm. Everything we've done in the last 100 plus years has been designed to do that. And partly it's because we can, because of our you know, ability to manipulate these forms of radiation, but also it's because we have a much better understanding of physics, of how radiation interacts with matter than we do with what's called radiation biology or what really happens on that cellular level. I mean, ideally it'd be nice to be able to give a person a substance that would make those bad cancer cells exquisitely radiation sensitive. And there are people who are trying to do that. There's even a program in prostate cancer to try to build, get prostate cells to a, take in a, by using a viral vector to take in a, a gene that codes for poor radiation resistance. But we're still kind of scratching the surface of that, which is why most of our advances in radiotherapy have been based on the physics side. And protons is just one shining example of the many. If you look back, when I was a resident, which it didn't seem that long ago now, but I guess it was in the late 1980s. Much of what we did were, at that time was called two-dimensional radiation therapy. Now, I know most of you have heard of IMRT and stuff. This is well before IMRT. You would create your radiation fields using two-dimensional x-rays, and you would draw on these films with a china marker to define the area you wanted to treat. So you'd be treating squares and rectangles and you know, circles and stuff. And there were millions and millions of people treated this way, including a lot of prostate cancer patients. And we cured lots and lots of people. But you can imagine if you're drawing a square to treat the prostate, you know, you're going to catch a lot of things in that which you don't want to treat. But you had to do this at that time because you didn't have a way of localizing the target any better. Everything was based on bony anatomy and a lot was based upon surface, as in skin anatomy. You draw these fields on the skin. You know, I look back at that now and I'm, you know, I kind of shudder and laugh and I think anybody should, but that was the best we could do at the time and it's, you know, it's gotten better. Now when you look at x-ray therapy, the most modern iteration of it is what we call IMRT, intensity modulated x-ray treatment. It requires and is based upon making a 3D model of what you want to treat, which is, as you're going to hear, same as protons. We have different ways of delivering IMRT, you have different brand names, you have CyberKnife is one manufacturer's way of doing it, TrueBeam is another, other, all these other different uh, you know, trade names in effect. They're all variations on that same x-ray theme. They are all x-ray based. And what they rely upon is using computer control to limit the fluence or limit the intensity of the beam if it's coming in or exiting through areas where there's a lot of normal tissue and then increasing the fluence where there isn't. This was introduced about 20 years ago into clinical radiation oncology, and it was it caught, caught on very quickly, largely because it was a relatively straightforward um, bolt-on you know, to existing equipment. 
you put on some equipment on an existing linear accelerator and you had IMRT. But I think it's important to note because I get this question a lot in proton world is that people started doing IMRT because of the physics, not because there were any phase three randomized trials done. And we get asked all the time, well, there's no phase three data on protons versus this and that. And well, there is some, but, but for the vast majority of what we do in radiation therapy in general, there was never a 3D, never a randomized trial done to prove it was effective or more effective than its predecessor. It was all based again on our knowledge of physics and that treating less normal tissue has always been shown to be better to the patient. So this is an example of a couple different treatment plans. This is using what's called three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy, which was the best of the early to mid 1990s. You have IMRT on the right. These are both targeting the prostate, which is this organ here in the center. And I think you can see that with either of these two modalities, you can do a pretty good job of conforming the high dose area to the prostate. Obviously much better on the right with IMRT than you can with 3D conformal, where you've got this big square of high dose. So you still, this was better than the 2D I showed you a little while ago, but when we went from 3D to IMRT, we got a much better conformality in the high dose area. The price you had to pay though, because these are x-rays, they don't stop where you want them to stop, is now you're starting to spread this low to moderate dose to a greater volume of the pelvis. It's a trade-off. With x-rays, you always have a trade-off. The dose has to go somewhere and you can put it, you know, you can put the high dose in one area, but the, the more beams you use to get a tight, nice tight high dose area, the more you start spreading what people say is low to moderate dose, but several thousand rads to the rest of the tissue that you prefer not to treat. And this is an example of that dose bath. The most, probably the most advanced form of IMRT now is what's called VMAT, volumetric arc radiation therapy. Again, look at how beautiful that high dose area is, how tightly conformed it is to the prostate, but you're giving 10 gray, 1,000 rad, 2,000 rad, literally from skin to skin with this. And that's where you start to see some differences. You know, I'll talk about those a bit later in side effects between treating with modern x-ray therapy and with protons where you don't have this dose bath. Despite that, IMRT is now the de facto standard. It has been probably for at least 10 to 15 years. As I mentioned a minute ago, we're not gonna go back and do a randomized trial of it. People wouldn't accept it. They'd say, why do you wanna give people more radiation if we know that's a bad thing? Protons, because of their physics, are a far superior way of delivering precision treatment but up until relatively recently, they were difficult to administer because now you need big machines, at least you used to, to generate particles of high velocity and to put them where you want. Where we're trying to get and where we're starting to get is to the point now, again, courtesy of technology, just like your cell phone and your laptop, to where the cost of delivering treatment with protons is to the patient, to the payer, approximately the same as, if not the same as doing IMRT. And we're already at that for a lot of applications. We do a lot of that here actually. Anyway, in case anybody doesn't know where the proton comes from, it's from the atomic nucleus. It's one of the fundamental particles in nature. Our source is hydrogen gas. We have a tank that lasts a couple of weeks and they come by and give us a new tank. You know, it's not like we're running out of hydrogen. It's the most common element in the universe, thankfully. That's what a proton is. And again, the phenomena by which protons deposit the majority of their radiation dose deep in the body and not superficially is, was discovered by this gentleman named William Henry Bragg. It's called the Bragg Peak in his honor. And essentially what it means is that what he found, and this was back in 1904, was if you shot a proton beam into a water tank, until that particle was almost coming to a stop, the ionization was relatively constant and relatively low. But in those last few millimeters where that particle was stopping, you got this big spike of dose. And then once the particle came to, came to a stop, the dose dropped to zero. It's a physical phenomenon. Again, he discovered this in 1904. Uh, 11 years later, he was the recipient of the Nobel Prize in physics for something else he did. So a, a typical underachiever. He, he this invented x-ray crystallography. But this is a discovery that dates back almost to the days of x-ray therapy. And again, it's just a physical phenomenon. It's nothing special except that this is the way that charged particles interact with matter as they go from go, being, being very fast to very slow and stopping. Um, I threw this slide in here because a few months ago, 
they announced uh, in, at Flinders University in Adelaide, South Australia, which is where Bragg did his work, by the way, 100 plus years ago, they've started construction of their first proton center in Australia, and they've named it after him, which I thought was really nice, as opposed to just, you know, picking the local grandee or whoever wrote the biggest check. But this is the Bragg Center. It's under construction. It's this building here, should be treating in a couple of years. Well, that's 1904. The person who made proton therapy, who thought of it as a clinical treatment was this gentleman, Robert R. Wilson, um, another fascinating individual. If you have a chance, if you're bored, go to Wikipedia and read about him. He's just it was an amazing, amazing man. Um, he was born in 1910 in the town of Frontier, Wyoming. He went to Berkeley and got his uh, PhD in physics. His PhD advisor was a guy named Ernest Lawrence, who was the Nobel Prize winner who invented the cyclotron. He was the youngest director of any of the experimental divisions at the Manhattan Project. So he would have been in his early 30s and he was working at Los Alamos and at Oak Ridge. The year after the war is over, he went back to academia. He was at, uh, briefly at Cornell, then he went to Harvard, but he wrote this paper uh, in July of 1946. And the subject of the paper was in essence, how can we use physics to improve the ability to radiate things without hurt you know, and, and create less toxicity? And all the principles he laid out in this paper underlie you know, what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Okay, he did that. He later went on to become the founding director of the Fermi National Laboratory out in Illinois. Uh, he's a sculptor. This is one of the sculptures he did at, it was at Fermi Lab. He designed the headquarters building. Just, he's, he, and he and his wife were actually buried at Fermi Lab. Um, just again, an amazing individual, true Renaissance man. So he said you could use protons to treat things and not treat as much normal tissue. The trouble in the 1950s when they first tried it was you didn't have machines that were designed to treat patients. So what did they do at Berkeley? They had a beam of particles coming out of the wall and they would put the patients in front of it like this. Right? Not something you really want to do every day, but that's the best they could do. And for 30 plus years, that was all people could do at Berkeley at the Harvard Cyclotron. It was 1988 when after about 10 years of effort, the Loma Linda facility had their groundbreaking. This is uh, James Slater here on the far right at the groundbreaking in April 1988. With James Slater, radiation oncologist, former department chairman there, he wanted to have protons in a clinical environment. He worked at Los Alamos and said, hey, this is good treatment, but we're treating two people a day. And we treat maybe six weeks of the year. This is never gonna go anywhere unless we put it in a medical environment and make a machine where we can treat 200 people a day instead of you know one or two a day. And that's what Loma Linda designed. This opened in 1990. First prostate patient was treated October 8, 1991. And this has been the model for most of the new proton centers where you have a accelerator and multiple treatment rooms. Although as you're gonna see, we now have a number of vendors that will sell you and make you and are doing a one room version of this, which is much smaller, much cheaper, and much easier for, you know, not for institutions to acquire. Oops, let's go forward, not back. Uh, this is our facility here in San Diego. We have five treatment rooms, three of which have isocentric gantries. Again, same design. You know, we have one accelerator and these different treatment rooms so we can treat lots of patients on a daily basis. We use a cyclotron to accelerate the particles to about 60% of the speed of light. It's super conducting for efficiency. It's been sitting in the southeast corner of the building since uh, February, since October of 2011 and has like a 30 year design life because there are very few, if any, moving parts. This is a kind of a crop picture of them bringing it in back in October 2011. It was built in Germany and then shipped over here. Um, something to keep in mind, and again, this is as true as proton technology as anything else. We tend to get, when we develop these technologies in physics, our machines tend to get bigger before they get smaller. So here's your 1910 x-ray you know, tube. This is a Van de Graaff generator of the 1940s to get mega voltage x-rays. This is the 1950s treatment unit, you know, big, big, big clunky machines. Even things like this where, you know, you've got this, you know, person here for scale. This was how they generated the same energy of x-rays that we now make in machines that would fit in the room I'm currently sitting in. But that's just technology, you know. You went from having these very large, cumbersome pieces of equipment to much smaller ones. That's exactly what's happening in the proton world. If you look around the United States and look around the rest of the world, there's oh, over 100 proton centers now. I've got a map coming up on these slides, but there's a bunch. Most of them are multi-room, like my facility here. However, 
where the greatest growth has been is in compact one to two room centers that will fit in a footprint that matches a modern x-ray therapy center. You don't need eight acres. You don't need all this land. You can put it you know, at a community hospital. That's where we're going with this. And that's where the majority of the new installations are gonna be. So you go from these multi-room facility to a single room center, which you know, they have here with a, on the outline of a tennis court. You've got a cyclotron and a complete gantry. This is what University of Alabama opened about two years ago. A year, last year, actually, it's what University of Miami is putting in. You can start with one room and then you can scale it up if you need to. And, and needless to say, this has dropped the price dramatically by about a factor of 10, actually, compared to before. But the clinical goal is to where on the clinician side, you don't see a difference in the treatment room or in the treatment. You pick whatever treatment is best for the patient. That was a proton treatment room. This is an x-ray therapy room. They look very, very similar. Briefly, the way we used to do protons and the way I treated at Loma Linda was to shape the beams using what's called a passive scatter technique, where you would actually physically run the beam through a bunch of mechanical devices, some of which were patient specific. So you would shape the beam so that Bragg peak would lay inside the target volume. And that worked fairly well, but it didn't give you a lot of, uh, you couldn't be very facile with it. You were doing everything, in effect, spreading out that bra Bragg peak to a blob of dose to surround the target. You couldn't say, hey, what if I want to give 50% more in here and 20% less in here? You couldn't do that. You put all the stuff in the way of the beam. You also get some neutrons produced. And probably most importantly, if you wanted to change this treatment plan, it would take a week or so to, to get to change it because you had to manufacture new blocks. So that's not, not a big issue in prostate cancer usually, but if I'm treating a lymphoma patient and their tumor is shrinking every three or four days, I can't be always a week behind in what I'm treating. I'm treating more normal tissue than I wanted to treat. So in 2004, the smart folks at the Paul Scherer Institute, which is a national laboratory in Switzerland outside of Zurich, came up with a pencil beam scanning system to where in effect, you're doing 3D printing with protons. You do you shape the beam entirely electromagnetically. You don't have any of those other pieces of junk in the way to shape it. And you're painting dose in layers that are a millimeter thick. So you can make those layers as heavy with dose or as low as the, with dose as you want. And you can change this plan. I mean, right now it takes us 24 hours to change it, but the not too distant future, we'll be able to change it in just a couple of minutes if we have to. Because all you're doing is changing the data file that drive these magnets that scan the beam. Where we are right now in the US with a number of facilities, we have, there are currently 37 operating centers around the country, which is up from you know, the grand total of one when I got involved in this. A couple of facilities have outgrown their existing centers and they've built new centers where they're building one. So University of Texas MD Anderson is building a new proton center adjacent to their existing center, which opened in 2006. University of Florida has just completed a new center in the parking lot of their existing center because they needed more capacity. Everybody is doing pencil beam scanning or you know, if they can't, they're retrofitting it. Most of the places that treat are able to do three-dimensional imaging online at, at the time of treatment, the position, the patients. And there's another you know, a dozen and a half that are under construction in the US. Most of these are those compact units like I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, they're quoting $25 million per room, which is still not cheap, but that's about, like I said, about one-tenth what our facility costs. And these are all pretty much turnkey. You go from breaking ground to having an operating center in less than two years, and a couple of these have come up in less than one year. So it's getting to be not that difficult if you, know, if you write a relatively reasonable check to have this capability. Uh, either we only have two right now in California. There's going to be a third one announced pretty soon, but th th you'll see more of these. And this is the current map. And like most of them are in the Midwest and East. You know, you'll get you know, like DC has Johns Hopkins has protons. Georgetown has protons. Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, in New York has protons. E these are all operating centers of some of the other construction ones. Uh, I showed this map in, in 2018. At that point, I think there were 26 operating facilities. And this is pretty pretty much the growth of operating centers worldwide, which we joke about this, you know, this curve, you know, it kind of starts to resemble a Bragg peak. What we don't want to have, we hope doesn't happen unless somebody cures cancer, which would be great, is to have the peak, <laughs> this part of the peak occur. But that's what's happening. We're seeing more and more of the centers that are actually becoming operational. 
And it's great having all this precision and it's really nice to be able to, to do things with it. But if you can't hit the target, it's pretty useless. And, and as I, you know, I alluded to earlier, imaging and the ability to make a three-dimensional reconstruction of what you want to treat underlies all modern radiation therapy. X-rays, protons, brachytherapy, doesn't matter. You have to be able to define what you want to hit. These are great tools, but if your map is poor, you're, 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 not, doing, you're not using them to their best ability. In the past, this is where protons have suffered, although this has changed now. But in the past, we didn't have the same imaging techniques that are used in modern X-ray therapy, things like comb beam CT. Um, we were the first US center to have that, actually, and that just goes back to about four years ago but it lets us do things we couldn't do otherwise because tumors among, you know, other things, tumors are not static. There's this very famous quote from Moltke the Elder, uh, you know, the victor of the Franco-Prussian War that no plan of battle ever survives contact with the enemy. You know what, cancers don't either and cancers are not static. A lot of times they will change as you treat. Not so much in prostate, but a lot of the other stuff that we treat. This is an example of lymph lymph uh, some uh, lymph nodes that had grown in the axilla you know, with treatment, the size of the lymph nodes were changed. So we had to change the plan to reflect the change in the target size. And with a scanning beam system and modern imaging, it's pretty easy to do that. In the past, we didn't know this was happening. Or if we did, we, there wasn't anything we, we could do about it. So we would overtreat because we had to, you didn't want to undertreat. You, you would overestimate the size of the target. So Anatomy changes, people lose weight, other parts of the body, they get pleural effusions, other things occur. I showed you the tumor configuration can change. All these things have to be taken into account in any modern x-ray therapy. Uh, we have gone to the fact, we, we, we have this comb beam capability, CT capability in three of our rooms and our gantries, which have led us to stop using the other two fixed beam rooms that we have because they don't have this capability. We wanna be able to use this on all patients, so that's all that we do. Okay, I'm um, gonna to touch on this all briefly. Hopefully I don't have to answer that. Um, we're actually, we're still treating patients here. That's why the, the, the phone is ringing. We did, once upon a time, when we first started here, we would do what's called an adaptive CT. We would do a CT first week of treatment to see if the patient's anatomy had changed. This is before we could do daily imaging. Now that we do daily imaging, we found that we had changes in anatomy in less than 1% of the patients. So we were able to eliminate doing this adaptive planning. It let us take one step out of our process, which was good, one less you know, scan for the patient. Let me get to the next slide here, if I can. Okay. But this is just you know the, where we're at right now. There's some other things coming down the line that are going to make us even more efficient. And the Billy, the key is computing capability and the ability to do calculations rapidly. So there is, there is a computing technique called Monte Carlo, which allows for a much better calculation of radiation dose than the current planning systems are using. This is becoming a clinical reality. And the important thing about it is it, it does a much better job of modeling what's actually occurring. So it lets us do better plans. You know, again, technology helping us to be able to deliver our treatment more efficiently and more and with a greater degree of safety. So let's talk a little about prostate cancer treatment with protons and you know, how, how the planning, all that stuff works. I have become a huge fan of multi-parametric MRI and I'm sure that you've had people that uh, have spoken to you, some of your other lecturers about it. I mean, it lets you see things you could never see with CAT scan. It lets you see internal prostate anatomy that you would never be able to see. It lets you see things like where there may be a dominant nodule that you want to hit harder. It lets you delineate the neurovascular bundles and, and stuff that you want to miss. CT is good, but it doesn't show you all this. So the best thing to do, of course, is to put the two together if you can. Uh, and modern planning systems allow us to do that. In fact, virtually everybody I treat here for prostate cancer, I will do a multi-parametric MRI as part of the planning process. Um, the only reason I don't is if for some reason the patients, you know, can't go undergo a MRI because they have a pacemaker, but it gives you so much more information. It just, you know, again, I look at what I used to do before and think, how did I do it? This is fairly typical with CT only. You've got the prostate here in the center. This is back in the day when we used to use the balloon and everyone, which we also no longer do, and I'll touch on that in a bit. 
here's the gland. Well, where in that gland is the, the stuff you want to treat to the highest dose? You don't know. It could be here, it could be here. You can't tell with CT where it might be. You do what's called a you know, multi-parametric MRI. This is the T2 weighted MRI. And lo and behold, look, here in the peripheral zone of the prostate, you can see the dominant nodule. You, know, you don't see it here, but on the MR, you can see it quite well. If you can see it, you can hit it. Not only from a biopsy standpoint, because that's become a standard procedure as well for biopsy, but a treatment standpoint. I want to put more dose here and not just put more dose to the entire prostate gland. And that's exactly what you know, we're able to do with this type of imaging technology. We also use what's called apparent diffusion, another part of the multi-parametric MRI, to confirm that that's malignancy. You know, point of all this is imaging has changed so much and now that we have the ability to take advantage of these changes, it's great to be able to actually use it in a clinical way, not just for diagnosis, but for treatment. So when you're treating this gentleman, you have a composite. You've got the MRI here, you've got his entire prostate outlined, and you have this area of dominant disease outlined where you wanna give the higher dose, and my cat checking a treatment plan, and you put a higher dose right there. 20% hotspot, 30% hotspot without treating everything else, just putting dose in the rest of the prostate, but the highest dose where you want it to be. This is looking at it too from the side. Now, by the way, you know, think back on those, when I showed you those pictures earlier of uh, different types of IMRT where you had dose from skin to skin. You've got a low dose here on the entrance beam, but you don't have any, once you get beyond this line, the dose is zero. It's not 20% or 30% like you had with IMRT where you're spilling dose throughout the pelvis. It's zero dose. This is what's called a sagittal view with the prostate being in the center. This is as if you cut the patient in half right down the middle. And again, once you get outside this colored line, this, the dose is zero. Um, these are displays that we use to check dose to targets, which are the, the curves here on the right. And these are normal tissue curves, which um, are, you can take my word for it, they're very good. Uh, I've also become a big fan of the spacer, the hydrogel, which again, I try to use on everybody unless there's some contraindication to it. With a good and now a typical hydrogel installation, you're going to get about a one and a half to two centimeter space between the back of the prostate, the tip of the arrow here, and the front of the rectum. That's a huge window to shoot protons through. What that does is it markedly reduces the radiation dose to the rectal wall. So the chances of rectal bleeding, which used to happen in about 20% to 25% of the patients that I treated with the balloon, are now down to about 3%. In fact, there was a nice paper on that from the University of Washington's Proton Center. So we use this for definitive treatment. We use it in retreatments. It's you know, the simplest way to protect something from radiation effect is you just don't hit it. We've probably done about, you know, probably close to 400 of these now, and just been, I've been extremely impressed with its utility. I mentioned retreatment. This is something which happens and partly because we're good at initial therapy. I'm gonna show you an example of a gentleman I treated originally back in 2009. His PSA went down to a low level and started coming back up. Well, what do you do? I think that you gotta offer the patient, first of all, is cryotherapy and surgery as an option and also hormonal therapy. Um, I'm gonna have to hold on for just a second because apparently I need to, to check something else. Oh. Nope, I do not. That's good. They are all done. Well, he didn't want to do any of those. So we said, let's talk about doing additional radiation. And in order to do this, the first thing we needed to do is try to get the rectum out of the way. That's the most critical organ. So we put in the spacer. You put in some carbon markers. To, you know, they're little markers that we could see on our x-rays and our CT scan. And we looked at his old plan and brought it in to see what doses have been given previously. And this is a situation. So you've got this gentleman here. He's got his hydrogel in place. You see the back of the rectum, or the front of the rectum, I should say, is now way back here, which is great. We did a plan where I wanted to just hit that area, this dark spot, with a high dose, not treat the entirety of the prostate to a high dose. I wanted to get some dose over here, but not a lot. I wanted to really pile it on in this area. And it doesn't probably doesn't show very well on the imaging here, but this is about the 10% dose line here at the front of the rectal wall. So we were able to successfully retreat his prostate without putting him at high risk for having an injury to this structure which had received radiation 
back in the 2009 timeframe. Another thing that we do a lot of are regional recurrences. This was a gentleman, he had a prostatectomy for stage three disease, meaning he had disease outside the prostate capsule. His PSA went down undetectable levels, but three years later started coming up. This was back when we could still get C11 acetate, which as you, I'm sure you guys know now is no longer available, but really PSMA is, is, is supplanting it. So the idea was, what if we just treat this recurrence now that we can target it? So we used a, a blend again, here's with the you know, imaging helping you out. This is a fusion of the C11 image, which is this kind of grayscale and his planning CT. And you can, you can appreciate that what I've got circled here in salmon, there's some increased uptake. This is the lymph node that was involved. So his recurrence was not in the prostate bed. It was in a lymph node in his pelvis. Great, I've got a target. That's what I did. I brought in a single beam, hit this really hard. We stopped the beam before it hits any of this intestine, which is all this stuff up here. And you treat to a high dose and you follow him PSAs and you find out that he's about three years out and he's free of disease. A couple of examples of a typical proton plan uh, using the scanning beam and versus an IMRT plan. This is a gentleman uh, where we had to treat his pelvis as well because he had high grade disease and was at risk for pelvic lymph node involvement. So we're treating the prostate to the highest dose. That's this red area here and here. And we're treating the pelvis to a lower dose to treat lymph nodes. And you could do exactly the same thing with IMRT. This was using a VMAP plan. And you look, these high dose areas are very, very similar in shape. The difference is all this extra dose that you don't get with protons that you're getting with x-rays. And you're gonna see that this has been shown to re that this extra dose does some things we don't like. I'll be touching on that here in a minute. All right, this is, I'm gonna probably breeze through just how we define what we wanna boost. Again, we use our imaging to do it. We have our target. So let's talk about some recently published data it, 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 because that's what everybody wants to know about, right? Are great. Protons are one of the many ways to treat prostate cancer. I mentioned earlier, the cancer cells don't know where they're being treated, what they're being hit by. The key to getting a good outcome in terms of cure is the dose. And where you like to see differences if you can is in reducing, it's reducing the toxicity. And we've got some interesting papers on that that have come out in the last couple of years. This first one, I think this was available in 2018. I think I talked about it. This was from the University of Florida. They looked at about 1,200 gentlemen who they had treated back in their earlier days of therapy, and they compared them to patients they treated at the same institution with IMRT. Um, everybody received close to the same radiation dose. They actually got a higher radiation dose at that time in the proton patients versus the IMRT patients. When they published this, the follow-up was over half a decade, which is good. Um, the ADT hormone therapy was used as appropriate in both arms, though it was used more in the IMRT patients. What they found, first of all, was that there was no difference um, in overall survival. Are you more likely to be alive or not between protons and IMRT for patients who are greater than 75 years of age? However, for the low and intermediate risk patients, they were seeing some differences. They weren't huge, but they were there. So for the proton patients, the chance of being free of disease at five years was just over 97% versus 91.6%. Again, very good either way, but somewhat higher and statistically significant. For intermediate risk, they also saw that difference. Subtle, not huge, but there, but you know, still significant or on the, this one was 0 0.05. For the high risk patients, no difference because those patients tend to have disease that comes back elsewhere. But this gave some hints that perhaps because they were getting a little higher radiation dose in the proton patients, they had a slightly better outcome. Now, despite the fact that they were getting a higher dose in those proton patients and the IMRT patients, they did not have increased toxicity. Uh, GI is gastrointestinal and you know, rectal bleeding, intestinal stuff. GU is urinary. They were looking at primarily the showstoppers, the grade three or greater complications. Those are the things that really fuss people's quality of life up. So in the proton patients, the incidence of grade three gastrointestinal problems was one-tenth of 1%, 1 very, very low, versus a very low 1.3% in the IMRT patients. And urinary, same type of thing. These are good either way. I mean, it's, it's hard to say that a 4.3% uh, grade three complication rate is really bad. But if you have another method that's going to give you a much lower rate, you know, why not? 
Their conclusion was that the proton patients had, had improved by freedom from relapse, despite the fact that um, the IMRT patients actually got more ADT and they got it for a longer duration. And despite the fact that the proton patients received more radiation, their toxicity was not higher, it was actually lower. And that's likely due to normal tissue sparing. This is some data that came out of Northwestern. Um, it was looking at patients that were treated at their uh, proton facility versus IMRT patients that were treated from a database. It wasn't, the, well, it wasn't necessarily the ones that they treated. First of all, no difference, um, a slight difference I should say in control rate at five years favoring the proton patients versus IMRT. Again, about a 5% difference like you saw from University of Florida. But the really important thing that they found was, and there's, it was this, they were looking at, among other things, second cancers. They, they, they first found this, saw this observation, said, well, wow, that's an interesting difference. I wonder why it is. It's because the rate of second cancers was somewhat, was significantly different between patients who received proton treatment and those who received IMRT. And these things tended to be hard to control and fatal. They had a six year, 6% 6 rate at five years versus 10% 10 10 at five years with IMRT. These numbers are both probably high. I'm gonna show you another paper in a second that shows lower numbers, but there's still significant differences. And the reason that uh, people were having you know, fatal events from this is because they were getting malignancies in the pelvis. If you're treating more pelvis with IMRT than protons, and they were developing more leukemias with IMRT because you're treating bone marrow with IMRT that you didn't treat with protons. You're exposing normal tissue to a known toxin, you're going to get toxicity. We, uh, what recently, this paper came out in about the last six months, we did a much bit deeper dive into just comparing uh, proton and IMRT for patients who had advanced disease where you have to treat the pelvic lymph nodes. Uh, we were looking to see if there was a difference in GI toxicity, you know, gastrointestinal events. We looked at both grade one, grade two, and grade three. Um, grade, grade three, or grade three are the showstoppers. Grade one and grade two are things that are somewhat more, they're, they're, people report them, but they're not, you know, things that require significant treatment. So we didn't see any grade three events in this patient population who got protons. We saw 2.4% grade two and 16% grade one. These numbers are all quite a bit lower than I'm what's reported in the IMRT literature. So again, hints that treating less normal tissue helps to minimize toxicity of treatment. But this is probably the most, I mean, to me, the most interesting paper. And this came out about uh, two months ago, it was published in Cancer. This is from the group at University of Pennsylvania. And they did a very involved look at radiation-induced second cancers, whether patients were treated with 3D conformal treatment, IMRT, or protons. And it wasn't just for prostate cancer. They were looking at all 10 different types of adult malignancies. And this was reviewing hundreds of thousands of charts, over 450,000. And this is, you know, talk about a monumental effort. 2.5 million person years worth of data and they were comparing the differences in second cancer rates between these three types of radiation therapy. What they found, the first thing I thought was interesting was that they didn't see any difference at all between 3D conformal and IMRT in terms of second cancer incidence. Um, however, with protons, the incidence of second cancers was one third the rate of either 3D conformal or IMRT. And they did all sorts of statistical tests to see if this was significant, and they said it was. They found this in all age groups, and they found it in all disease sites that favored proton treatments except for lung cancer. Um, and even when they did some subset analysis, they said, yeah, if we take the prostate patients out, we still see this. If we look at just head and neck, we see this, and breast cancer, we see this. And they had a, a scatter plot where they, they were looking at what's called the odds ratio, for these different diagnoses that were treated with protons, IMRT, or 3D conformal. And in every case, except the lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, the chances of developing a second malignancy were significantly less with protons and favor proton treatment. So their conclusion was that, first of all, you consider the number of patients that they examine, number of charts, highly, highly uh, powerful statistically very relevant because of the way that they did their data analysis. Importantly, 
We have a lot of computer models that are used to predict radiation toxicity that have spit out numbers that are very similar to what they found in this trial. So this data is all consistent with the computer predictions. Um, we have very strong evidence that treating less normal tissue results in fewer second cancers. And, you know, we see this, um, you know, through, again, throughout the diagnoses, but perhaps the exception of non-small cell lung cancer. Last thing I'm going to talk about is just uh, what's called SBRT because that's become very popular in the x-ray therapy world. That acronym stands for Stereotactic Body Radiation Therapy. In essence, it's a technique where we give high doses over a short time span. It is not restricted to x-ray therapy. It was actually first done with particles back in the 1960s with helium ions. These are usually done in five treatments or less. Um, it's been used a lot in prostate cancer. The use is growing. I'm going to talk about my experience with it. Uh, essentially, people have said, suggested that it seems to work about as well for low and intermediate risk patients as any other way of delivering radiation. It does create, though, more toxicity because you're giving considerably higher doses per day, and that's been my experience as well. Those grade three events, the ones we don't like, you start to see significant numbers of them, uh, depending, again, on whose data set you look at. Um, one way to do that is using CyberKnife, which again is x-ray therapy based, but you're just, you're, you can use any different number of techniques to pile that high dose into the prostate. Um, the current national recommendations though for how we should give radiation therapy at this time, this is from the, the most recent NCCN guidelines, the preferred method is to use what's called moderate hypofractionation. So not doing this all in a week, which is what this ultra hypofractionation is, and not necessarily doing it in nine weeks like I used to with everybody, but somewhere between four weeks to six weeks appears to be the sweet spot in terms of getting the same biologic effect and not dragging the treatment out forever. So logistically, it's easier for the patients. And for about the last four years, I've been treating virtually everybody in 28 fractions because of the, the data that suggests that's a really good way to go. Um, it's going to kind of breeze through. This is the same kind of treatment plan for stereotactic radiotherapy that we do uh, for any other type. Um, I want to mention that this is actually being studied at Northwestern. They're doing a, a trial of using protons to do SBRT, and they've said so far that their acute toxicity is no different than when they're doing this, their treatment over nine weeks. My experience has been different than that. The NCCN that national guidelines say support SBRT, but they say if you're gonna do it, you should really do it in the context of a clinical trial. So here's my experience here in San Diego. Um, I've treated a total of 43 gentlemen who had low and intermediate risk disease with a five fraction regimen. And this was designed to have the same biologic effect as the 28 fraction regimen. So we did five fractions over two weeks. Everybody got a spacer, everybody got CT and MRI, you know, all this stuff, we do the same, whether it's five treatments or 28. I've stopped doing this though for the moment because I'm not happy with what I'm seeing in terms of toxicity. First of all, I see quite a bit more acute urinary toxicity, frequency, urgency, and complete voiding than if I do this over 28 treatments over five and a half weeks. And the other thing I don't like is that this tends to persist. So I've had a few of these guys, even a year out, they're still having trouble like this, uh, which you just, you hardly ever see with a, a little slower regimen. So I've had to put a few of them on short courses of steroids to get their inflammation under control. It resolves, but you know, this is a long time to be dealing with it. And the reason that they get these increased toxicity is because we're giving bigger slugs per day. So I've taken a break from doing this. I wanna see how this pans out. I've, I've gone back to doing a treatment in 28 fractions as opposed to doing it you know, in, in a five. So in conclusion, you know, first thing I want people to realize is that this is no longer a boutique treatment. We've been doing proton treatment of prostate cancer and other things for a long time. In fact, prostate cancer, a lot of people think it first started at Loma Linda. No, the first prostate cancer patient ever treated with protons was in 1977 at the Harvard Cyclotron. And in fact, the first paper in the medical literature specifically addressing treating prostate cancer with protons was published in JAMA in 1979, so four decades ago. What has limited its use until relatively recently was the expense of the machinery and therefore the, the relatively uh, small number of facilities that were available. This is changing rapidly, just as x-ray therapy has changed rapidly and become more available. 50 years ago, 
x-ray therapy was not available everywhere. You were a few centers and they were, you know, they were scattered around the country. Now you can get it 3,000 plus places in the U.S. Our ultimate goal, and we are reaching this, is to get to the point where there is no difference to the payer in cost between delivering protons and x-rays. This is what people, the insurers don't like. It's not that they will say the technology doesn't work and the treatment doesn't work. They don't want to pay more for it. But they want, to, they want to write one check and not a different check. And that's what we're trying to get to by making the machines cheaper. The published data when you, indicates that when you compare protons to IMRT that we first of all have the same recur rates. We have a lower instance of GI toxicity. We have less bone marrow suppression because we're treating less of the pelvis. We also, I didn't, it also create less testosterone suppression. You get radiation to the testicles when you treat with IMRT and that causes a drop in testosterone production, which you don't get with proton treatment. And as I showed you, we see a lower incidence of radiation induced second cancers. I appreciate you guys, you know, listening to me and giving the chance to have the presentation. I'm going to go ahead now and I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. I'll be happy to have a conversation with you. Okay, let's, let's see if we have uh, anything here in chat. Um, anybody want to submit a question for the doctor? I don't have questions. Amazing. Either that or your advice, <laughs> something better to do. Um, I see Larry, it says Larry has raised his hand. Yeah. Okay. Can you, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, you're off mute now. Okay. Thank you for your appearance. It was an excellent presentation, doctor. And the question I have, you've provided very nicely five years of uh, studies in comparison, in comparing IMRT to proton therapy. My question is, how, if, is there any, is there any statistics on, on, on 10 year studies? If so, how did that, work out. Yeah, so we, if, you, if you look at what I would consider to be our uh, treating with protons with radiation doses that are what we currently use, um, that goes back to the mid to late 1990s. There was a, a randomized trial that we did at Loma Linda, it was Loma Linda and Mass General, the participants, called the PROG 9509 study. And we enrolled patients between 1996 and 2000. And that was, uh, I think, just under 400 gentlemen. And we published the results in that in 2010. We actually did two publications out of it. The most recent one, though, is from 2010. And if you look at those, at that time, those, the follow-up was right around 10 years median. If you look at the biochemical freedom from relapse rates in those patients, and you compare them to patients who receive IMRT to similar doses, and that's the key, is the similar dose, they're virtually identical. I, I didn't show the slide, but we, we did a comparison of those patients also to brachytherapy and came to the same conclusion. So I, I'm not surprised by that because the, the cancer cells don't care about the radiation modality. What they care about is how hard you hit them. So if you give the same dose with any of these modalities, you're gonna get the same result. But uh, the reason that the comparisons I showed you here are shorter is that not surprisingly, our techniques continue to evolve. The way I treat it back in the 90s is not the way I do it now. And that paper, for example, the ones, the two from Northwestern, um, those were patients who were treated with pencil beam scanning because we're trying to compare, you know, as close to the proverbial apples to apples as you can get. But yeah, so I, I think it's clear that the outcomes are very similar. We, we do all everything, you know, we do all the same things. We use ADT in proton treatment exactly like you do in x-ray therapy. Same recommendations, same durations, et cetera. We use equivalent radiation doses. Where I see the differences are in the tissues outside of that target area. That's where the difference really lies. Uh, thank you. Uh, Neil, so, you have a couple of questions. I, saw. I sure do. On Larry, did you, have, uh, did you finish your question? Yeah, one, one follow-up question. Okay. Does, does, does uh, taking ADT with the with the proton therapy, does that make a big difference, or is it this? It makes it, it, it makes as much of a difference as it does in IMRT for the same reason. So if you um, you know if you look at patients of high risk disease, 
If you treat them with radiation alone, any type of radiation, protons, IMRT, doesn't matter, you're gonna cure around 60 to 70%. That's radiation alone. You treat those same patients with radiation plus a uh, longer duration ADT, you know, and I like 18 months, but people do 24, whatever. You improve those results by 20% to 25% across the board, irrespective of the radiation modality. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Well, we got three questions here. Uh, first, can proton therapy be used to treat a single bone metastases near the spine? All the time. <laughs> oh yeah, in fact, um, we, we, because of wanting to spare the spinal cord, uh, protons have, have carved out a niche in treating spinal cord-based tumors, either metastatic or primary, you know, like chordomas and chondrosarcomas. So we've been doing that you know, in the proton world for 40 plus years. Um, down here, I, I, was, I have a gentleman I was planning today, is actually a retreatment. Um, he had prior radiation to a metastasis in the lumbar spine. Unfortunately, it didn't control it. Now it's regrowing. We're going to retreat. He was treated with x-rays. Now we're going to treat protons to a higher dose. So yeah, we use it all the time in critical areas like that. Uh, and in the last three or four years, as the thinking on treating oligometastatic disease has changed or people are doing more and more of it, the use of protons in that setting has certainly increased. Um, let's, let me come back here to an earlier sure. question. Uh, what about vessel spar sparing? Blood vessel sparing? Um, it it, it, you can. It, it depends on which blood vessels you're talking about. The, the big blood vessels are pretty radiation resistant because they're big and thick and have nice muscular walls, and that tends to make them less affected by radiation therapy. Uh, you're, you often, well, if you're treating the prostate alone with protons, you're going to spare the major blood vessels because you're not treating through them. If you're treating with IMRT, you're going to get some dose to them. If you're treating the pelvis though, you use the blood vessels as surrogates for lymph node position. In fact, you deliberately, you, you, you map them. So you can't really spare them very well. Where we do vessel sparing is in a different part of the body. So for example, we are, we're treating an increasing amount of breast cancer with protons, especially left-sided breast. And one of the things that we can do with that is we can spare the coronary vessels. So you map them out and you tell the computer, don't hit these. And since they are you know, a couple a centimeter or two away from your target, you can spare them quite nicely. Can I follow up on that question? That was my question. Sure. Sure. So I read a University of Michigan study where they, uh, I, I don't know if they invented it or what, but they were able to get a 87% um, success rate in terms of uh, avoiding uh, erectile dysfunction and they were comparing it um, okay. to another method and basically what I've been reading is that with radiation you end up in the same boat after a number of years as if you have the gland removed. It just, you lose your sexuality, whatever you want to call it, it gradually and so this University of Michigan's innovation claims that they've avoided that. What do you think about the proton therapy in terms of that? I, I'd like to see what they were doing. The, the issue with erectile dysfunction and radiation treatment is usually, a, it's a difficult, difficult to spare the neurovascular bundles because of their location immediately adjacent to the peripheral zone of the gland which is where most of the cancers occur. So the problem you run into is if you try to get too aggressive about carving out the blood, the, the neurovascular bundle, you're gonna underdose the part of the gland where you're gonna find the majority of the, the tumors. So I, that's also an issue with uh, nerve sparing prostatectomy. The way that I've gathered data on erectile dysfunction post radiotherapy is to try to be very subjective about it because you, see, you, know, you can't, there is an objective test of course. And, I tend to tell the guys, look, you know, depending on your age group, it depends upon that. It depends upon your functionality beforehand, and it depends upon other medical issues. So, for example, if I have treating 100 guys between the ages 50 and 59 who are perfectly functional beforehand and do not have diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to tell those guys, look, about a third of you within a year, 9 to 12 months, are going to say my, my erectile functions change. And in some of you that were reporting a change, it's going to be a significant change. 
Um, and some of you, it's going to be a minor change. The best way to minimize it, prevent it from happening, is to use uh, uh, you know, sildenafil, tadanafil early as opposed to late. Do those findings get worse as people get those, those, those chances get worse as people get older? The answer is yes, definitely. Do the guys I treat at age 50, are they more likely to have problems at age 70 with sexual function? I think the answer is yes. Uh, but part of that too is that there's also, you know, it's not just the radiation, it's not just the surgery, it's also part of the natural, the natural process. So I, I very, I'm very leery of when I see reports of high incidences of ED, of, of people not getting ED, because it depends upon how you ask the question, who asked the question, and what is your, what's your benchmark? That's what I'd want to look at in that paper. How are they evaluating whether a person is sexually is functional or not? Uh, Pat Walsh, when he did his first publications on nerve sparing, said, with nerve sparing, I think it was around 80% of my patients are, are potent. And then somebody asked, well, what's the definition you use? Well, if they could have one erection in the first year post-surgery sufficient for intercourse, they're potent. Obviously, that's you know, a very liberal definition of, of, of sexual function. But I, I agree. I think that anything you do to try to, obl to obliterate the prostate is very likely going to affect sexual function to some degree. It just you can't get around it because of the anatomy. Um, and there and there are things you can do to mitigate it. Like, you know, using medications early seems to help. Not having other medical conditions certainly helps. But it is a significant risk with any of these treatments, and I don't think it's any different between protons, IMRT, or brachytherapy in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if we, wait, we have some background noise, I guess, from somebody here. If you can mute yourself. We got some conversation in the back. Um, what approach do you consider once the prostate has been removed? I guess now we're, we're talking about something metastatic through the body. If I understand this question, um, or, or maybe it's talking about post-operative treatment. So you know, it's not that unusual to have a positive surgical margin, and then have a subsequent rising PSA at some point post-op. Uh, it's 25 percent, thirty percent of the guys will have that. And beginning about ten years ago, when the couple of studies were published, that said, "Hey, you know, you can salvage a lot of these folks with radiotherapy." The idea of early intervention with post-operative radiation became quite popular. And you can do that with x-rays, you can do it with protons, um, you often do it in conjunction with a short course of ADT. So the first thing that needs to be kept in mind in post-operative patients is you got to be followed carefully, it means regular PSAs, especially if your surgical pathology had uh, findings like a positive margin or a close margin or seminal vesicle involvement that put you for at high risk for recurrence. And then if it looks like the PSA is rising, you try to ascertain, is it because of a recurrence in the bed or because it's metastatic? And there are ways you can somewhat tell that apart. And this is also where the more the, the imaging studies are helping us quite a bit, things like PSMA. But a very significant percentage of these patients, you're going you're gonna to come to the conclusion their cancer is recurring in the operative bed because the margins were close due to the anatomy. And then you radiate the area. Uh, and why do that with protons versus x-rays? Same, same reason as treating the prostate with protons versus x-rays. It's not to get a better outcome in terms of salvage of the, the, you know, the cancer. It's to spare radiation to all the surrounding tissues, not hit the intestines, not hit the bone marrow. But at any one time, about 10 to 20% of the patients I have under treatment here for prostate cancer are post-operative. Because again, it's not that, it's not that unusual a circumstance. Very good. Uh, where on the East Coast will I find the treatment center where doctors and technicians who are most experienced in the methods of treatment you spoke of? Okay, um, there, as you saw from the map, there are a number of facilities on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, many, most of the major academic centers actually either have protons or they're in the process of getting them. So who has the longest experience back there and where I, you know, where, where places that I would consider going? Well, uh, about two or three come to mind right away. Uh, University of Florida, which has their proton center in Jacksonville, has recently installed a pencil beam scanning unit. Um, that's the one that they built in their parking lot, their existing proton center. So you know, they, they've been doing proton therapy for 15 years. That'd be an excellent place to go. Miami Baptist uh, in Miami, they're about, they've been in operation about three to four years. They have excellent personnel. 
again, you know, another place that I think you, that people would be well served at. Going up the coast, uh, University of Maryland's facility is a copy of this facility. It's another multi-room variant proton center. They've been in operation since 2015. That'd be a good option. Yeah, and then you've got some heavy hitters that have just started at this. So Memorial Sloan Kettering, is another, which is also a copy of this facility, has only been in operation since last uh, July, but they did like we all do. They go out and grab experienced personnel from other proton facilities. So their medical director was at University of Maryland for many years. Their physicist has a lot of proton experience, et cetera. And then you have Hopkins, um, which opened up relatively recently, but did the same thing. So those are, those are some I would, you know, would look at. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't, you can't get good treatment at the Ackerman Center in, in Orlando. It doesn't mean you can't get good treatment at Pronova in Knoxville. But you know, those, are, those are facilities that come to mind. If I'm thinking about, if someone asked me, which I do, where, where should I go or where would you go in that part of the country? And that's where I would look. Okay. Uh, can you target a bone metastasis using data from a PSMA? Oh, yeah, you bet. <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. Yeah, PSMA is another fantastic tool. Um, believe me, everybody in this specialty is waiting for the day the FDA says this is no longer an investigational agent so we can all start using it. I have, as part of this facility here, we have our own imaging suite. We have a CT, we have a MR, and we have a CT PET. So we do Oxman PETs here and we blend them with our planning. We use those for planning, you know, Oxman PET CTs. But I love TSMA and also the F18, I get it, like DY, PCL, whatever they're doing at Stanford. We get that data all the time. We send patients to UCLA all the time, and we use PSMA to target target bone mets. We target lymph nodes. We target within the prostate. We'll target lymph, uh, you know, other areas. Recurrence after surgery. It's a fantastic tool. Great. Um, what is the difference between a carbon marker and a gold marker? So they're. Um, Probably difference in price, but that's not what the questions of. <laughs> They're made by the same company, actually. So first of all, what this refers to is we like to put something into the target so that we have, in effect, a benchmark in the gland or whatever we're treating so we can see it on our daily imaging. For x-ray therapy, since they're using megavoltage x-rays to image the patients, they want to use a very dense marker, and they use a gold marker, made, typically made by a company called Visicoil. It's made of gold, nice dense material. You can see it on a mega voltage x-ray. In the proton world, you wanna have a marker as well, but we don't like high density material in our targets. Why? Because theoretically, it could actually act like a shadow. You know, you've got this high dense material and you're slamming protons into it. You could have an underdose right behind it. Now that's, you know, people argue this and I don't think it's a real big issue, but, and there are ways around it. You can treat from more than one direction. But that's why we use carbon. We can see the carbon markers with our kilovoltage cone beam CT, and we're not worried about it causing a permutation of the beam made by the same company. So you call up uh, Visicoil and say, we have a proton center. We need proton carbon markers, same size shape as the gold seeds. And that's what we put in for our fiducials. Outstanding. Um, anyone else have any questions? I'm not seeing them on group chat. Larry looks like he's talking here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So how would you compare IMRT to Proton in the context of lymph nodes? The success. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, the success is going to be based upon the dose that you give. And with either technology, you can give the same radiation dose to the lymph nodes. And I'm assuming you're talking about pelvic lymph nodes. In the, in the, yes. Okay. yes. The big difference there is the dose to the intestines. That's where the differences are quite profound. So in general, when you look at an IMRT plan and a proton plan, the more complex the shape, so you know, the, the, when you go from a spherical target to something which uh, the lymph nodes are kind of in the shape of an H, the more complex the shape, the greater the disparity in total dose between a proton plan and an IMRT plan, because using x-rays to cover irregular shapes means you have lots and lots of beams coming in and dose going here, there, and everywhere. Whereas, for example, to treat the pelvic lymph nodes with protons, you typically use a grand total of one beam. You bring in a posterior beam in the shape of that U or H, and you stop it. 
before it hits the intestines. So the difference you see clinically is that when you treat the pelvis with protons, your patients don't get fatigue and they don't get diarrhea. So could you say that uh, the proton in terms of attenuating the target is more precise? No, they're both, they're both equally precise at hitting the target. It's the difference is the dose beyond the target. Okay. We've, you know, as an object lesson for this, that our clinical partners have, has been uh, UC San Diego, actually since early 2014, but officially in, 20, in 2017. The clinicians at UCSD have become quite enamored of using protons to treat the pelvis and not just in prostate cancer. We do it in rectal cancer and some other things to where that's their preferred method of doing pelvic radiotherapy when you want to treat the nodes because it reduces the toxicity. The car target coverage, the same. You, know, you can hit these things with the same dose, but it's, you're going to pay a bigger physical price with IMRT because of all that dose going everywhere else. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe we can unmute here, Dave, and see if anyone else has questions. Because I'm not seeing them on the chat. Well, uh, I would like to try and... Look, there, there's one that just came up, sorry, and I'll have to answer that then. It was a question about a, pro a problem with the steel implants and that and such. Um, carbon. Um, wow, we don't have carbon in the U.S. yet. Hopefully we will. Mayo Clinic gets our center up. Um, we use, we, we can treat with, I mentioned earlier, we don't like metallic material, but we do it all the time. Uh, you know, one of the areas where protons are used routinely is in treating spinal cord and skull-based tumors. And virtually all those patients have undergone some type of big surgery first with stabilization rods that are put in and you have to work around it. Um, I've treated lots and lots of guys with bilateral hip replacements. The re the, what you do first of all is um, you benefit again from imaging technology. The, the newest software packages that are available for CT and MRI have metal artifact reduction algorithm. So they take out the algorithm out of the, uh, they take out the, the metal, the distortion out. In addition, you pick, your, you pick beam angles that don't treat through the steel. So you, you pick an, air, an angle that doesn't have to treat through the high, high density material. So yes, we do it all the time. Um, it was more of an issue at Loma Linda because of the technology up there, but I'm able to treat bilateral hips and with, fem with femoral rods and all that stuff. All right, um, doctor, I, I wanted to show um, this chart and tell people um, that, Neil, maybe we can send out this link on the virtual tour of the California yeah, Proton Treatment Center. Sure. And um, this is a pretty impressive, um, you know, video that you can watch at the virtual tour of his facility. And he's got testimonial of a person who got help through his clinic there and so that might be something we can do to we're hoping uh, to and i appreciate that we're hoping to resume their lot we used to do all these tours live once a week but obviously that's for the moment oh, that's on hold yeah yeah thank you for making that uh it, it's not like in the good old days yeah i wish well we'll get back to that um but thank you yeah they, they did we i think it's a, it's, a, it's a very well done production it just shows that a lot of the, the the actual technological guts of the facility um, Mr. Harker, to answer your question, I've done it. To, can, the question is, can we use protons like focal laser ablation? I've done it and I've regretted it. The reason I regret it is that the patients tend to fail, just like after focal laser ablation, you tend to get failures just beyond whatever, wherever you limit the dose. I'm going to drop the dose off here and they fail just beyond it. So I, it's something which I don't like to do because my experience with it has been unfortunately universally disappointing in terms of recurrence. Um, and that's been my experience on, you know, with, I've treated probably about at this point about uh, what between one to two dozen guys who've had laser ablation and then failed. And they usually fail in the same way. It's just at the edge of the char cavity. Now it doesn't mean that laser ablation doesn't work. I only see the ones where it doesn't work. But when I've tried uh -huh. to do that with, with, you know, with protons, I've been unhappy with what I've seen. Okay, so would you say that the, the, the hot laser tip is it is it a little more directed than the proton? Is that why? No, that the, 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 they're both directed. The issue is that prostate cancer tends to be multifocal. Yes. And so what, what, with it, when you're doing a partial gland treatment, you have to make an arbitrary decision. I'm going to stop at this point. And if you're doing that with MRI guided laser ablation, so I'm going to stop, you know, a millimeter beyond the the uh, 
the, the abnormality. Mm -hmm. But microscopically, there tends to be disease beyond that. So the, the idea behind focal treatment is we can come back and treat you again. Right, which, which sounds logical to me, but I guess not, huh? Yeah, well, it, 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 people do it, and it's, it's being done as part of cl you know, as clinical trials, which is the way we're learning from it, that the downside to letting people recur is yes. that now you're allowing potentially for a, meta you know, for a wave of metastasis to occur because we've known for 30 years in prostate cancer that local recurrences put you at a higher risk for metastatic disease. And this is why, at least you know, up until now, when we treat prostate cancer, whether it's radiation or surgery, we tend to treat the whole gland. Yes, people do partial gland treatment. Um, again, it, it, it does work, but it, it may not, we, we're still not sure that it's as good an idea as treating the entire prostate because of the multifocality of prostate cancer and the fact there aren't any barriers to spread within the gland. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, the advantage of it is that it can reduce side effects, right? If you're going to get a treat a portion, and that's why the, the guys have done this on said, look, I might, you know, to me, sexual function is important. I want to spare the opposite neurovascular bundle. I'll say, great, makes sense, but realize this is non-standard. And I do a great job of sparing the neurovascular bundle. The dose over there is zero. If you treat just part of the gland, there is no dose the other side. Right. You have a higher recurrence rate, unfortunately. Okay. okay. Um, let me just answer Urban's question and then I'll probably let you guys wrap it up. But to, to, get, to make an appointment to come down here, um, you know, we have our telephone number on the website. You can call up uh, the clinic nurses, the intake nurses, and they'll start taking all the information on how to come down for a consult or actually... Uh, that's what an anachronism, boy, how to do a Zoom console. <laughs> that's what we're probably, we, we're, you're perfectly welcome to come on down. We're, I'm doing as many of these face-to-face -face as we can. And that's, that's my preferred method. And I'd say about a third of the gentlemen, well, all the things we're creating here, people do that. But, you know, at the same time, telemedicine has, is nice that we can still see people who can't, can't make or are concerned about making the trip. But that'd be the e easiest way to get scheduled. Okay, basically, I, uh, does anyone else have any questions they'd like to submit through chat or, or ask? Dave, we might want to unmute here and see if anybody yeah. has any questions they want to ask. If I knew how to unmute, I would, Neil. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, um, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing is letting people unmute themselves. So if they want to ask a question, um, unmute yourself and you can ask your question. So doc, Dr. Rossi, I, I, I see that I didn't get a direct phone number um, for your facility. Um, was it in that link to your virtual um, touring? Uh oh, sorry, I, I got it. Yeah, the, the general, it, it should be in the link and you know, it definitely is on our website. The general number is area code 858-549-7400. Um, just start that and then just ask for the, the, the uh, clinical coordinators and one of the nurses will pick up. But it's, you know, we have, it's on our website. We have a website like everybody else in the world and it's on there. Or you can look at UC San Diego's website and it will direct you over here as well. Dr. Rossi, can you hear? Yes. Hi, this is Chuck Metzger. I used to send you patients from Glendora. Yes. yes. A long time ago. I remember that. In fact, um, I saw one the other day that was the, well, must have been one of your first patients. He's like 92, and you know I can't remember what disease he had. So he obviously a cure. Uh, I was just curious, how are you surviving in San Diego with David Crawford being in the same environment? Uh. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I see David at Tumor Board almost every week. Oh, bet you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, David's he's quite the, the he's quite the character. He's he's a, he's it's he's an enjoyable person to sometimes a, a, to spar with. As you know, he he doesn't exactly he's not exactly reticent about about expressing his opinion. No, he's not. Um, but no, I, it, we we. I, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't come in and, and, and upended UCSD. Um, and actually, he's been very, he, he's a good person to have at the tumor board. It worked. We've been, you know, we've been busy, busier here now in the last, probably last year since, and he's been here about a year than we ever were. Yeah. I, I, must, I missed the first part of your presentation, but is it getting any easier to get coverage for the proton? Insurance, generally, yes. Um, you know, Medicare has, has covered this for nearly 30 years and they continue to do so. 
what we've had with a lot of the private insurers recently is we've been able to come up with contracts where the cost to them is the same as x-ray therapy because the technology has gotten cheaper so you don't have to have the difference in reimbursement to the same degree to pay for the equipment that's especially yeah. true of the newer centers like the one and two room centers but we're able to do that here as well uh, that's one also one of the reasons where hypofractionation has become so um, useful not only is it clinically you know efficient logistically it's great and it drop it cuts the cost of treatment in half without doing any change to your facility the only thing you change is the way you've delivered the treatment yeah and that well, there have been a lot of changes any any use of the new androgen receptor inhibitors that are coming along and uh, and as an edge you know as a Oh, well, you know, everybody's getting Zytiga, it seems. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're still pretty much you know, doing the standard things. We don't have any protocols at the moment for any of the investigational agents, but you know, I, like I said, virtually everybody seems to get, the, the, they're put on the, the AD on Lupron and Zytiga right off the bat, especially if they have a locally advanced disease. Yeah. Well, very good. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank As you. always, we appreciate your contribution to the practice of urology to help all of us. Thank you. Yes, yeah. I, I, I remember quite well the, over the years of the patients and, and I appreciated that. Well, some of them were actually, you know, normal people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Dr. Mister, thank you. Okay, so I just sent out in chat so everyone can write it down if you didn't get it from the doctor, his phone number in San Diego. It, California protons. So look on the chat and you can write it down if you didn't get it. All right. Any more? Oh, Neil, you're muted, so unmute yourself. Um, well, uh, if, if anyone else has a question, unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, my insurance is in Arizona. I've got an HMO with Obamacare and I can't go outside of the state. Can, do, can you recommend an imaging center there or any professionals there? So for, for, the, for, for actually for treat, um, imaging, you know, that the, the Phoenix molecular imaging is no longer doing the C11 acetate scans, but they're doing other functional imaging studies and they're located in Phoenix. What's um, it called? Uh, Phoenix Molecular Imaging. The physician's name is Fa his first name is Fabio. Oh, I call him. Yeah, he's not doing anything now. He's doing a, a healthy living practice. Medicine. Okay. Well, yeah. the, other, the other option that comes to mind would be Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. They have protons there too. Oh, I can't go there either. Too bad. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what insurance does to you. Did you look at the U of A in Tucson? No, would you recommend that? I mean, they're, they're a good academic medical center. I, I believe that they have a good radiation oncology department. Um, okay. I, I don't know about their imaging department per se, but I know several of the rad ox there, and I, I, I think they're excellent. I could go there. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, well, let me ask. Uh, this is Larry. Uh, Dr. Rossi, is, is Fabio Omita still doing imaging in Phoenix? Sounds no. like he's not. He's, as Charles just mentioned, he, he's switched more or less to being to doing concierge medicine. So, you know, Fabio was doing all that work with C11 acetate, and yeah. what happened is that even it's an excellent imaging agent. It was it's great. The problem with it was the half life. It has a 20 minute half life. So the only way you could do it is if you were at a facility where you had a, a cyclotron on site to generate it. So he had that. But because it was obvious to the, you know, that the, basically that the people who were sponsoring his work that PSMA is going to knock that out, as are some of the F-18 based prostate imaging agents that are coming out, they stopped funding the production of C11 acetate and are now using the cyclotron for doing other things. And at that point, he decided to get out of the imaging business, although he still does read, he'll, he'll, he'll do second reads of if scans all the time. But he's, okay. I guess he's no longer doing, he's no longer operating an imaging center primarily. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else with anything? Comments? Doctor, thank you as always for, for presenting to us. Thanks, guys. Hopefully yeah. next time. And, uh, thank you so much. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, adjourn the meeting and I, I will send around the link for the virtual tour along with the survey. Great. Thank you. All, all. right.
Thank you Good very night. much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you.